A $1 bid, bill met a $20 bill. He hadn't seen him in a while, and he said, hey, where have you been? Haven't seen you in years. By the way, you do know dollar bills don't talk to each other. It's just a joke. It's kind of starting out with an introduction. It's good to see my good buddy Don here as well. The $20 bill replied, he said, man, I've been doing a lot of traveling. I've been to the casino. I went to a cruise. I went on to a ball game. Went to the mall, Christmas shopping, fancy dinners, to the beach, to the mountains. Man, you tell it, I've been there. I've been living the high life. How about you? And the dollar bill replied with a sign, me, same old stuff, church, church, church. That's all I do is church. <laughs> Some of y'all are just like, I, I don't get it. All right, so this morning, hopefully, this message will inspire you to figure out more than just where the $20 bill is going, it'll inspire you to examine the state of your heart. The message is not about giving as much as it is about your heart. I hope you keep that in mind. We're in a series through the book of Malachi called Counter Shock, and today's message is called Pious Thieves. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word, Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 6. It's on the screen, it's on the website, my blog site, it's in the bulletin, many ways to keep up with what's coming up. God is speaking. He says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? Here comes the answer. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? The answer returns in tithes and offerings. Now I know that as you saw the title of that message and you heard the joke and as you heard what I said so far, you've already made your assumptions that here we go, we got a building going up next door, somebody's got to pay for it. And here's Pastor Shaw's message, trying to put a guilt trip on you to get you to give more. I want you to hear me very carefully. I've been a pastor of this church coming up on 19 years. This is my first and only church and will be my only church. It's 19 years. When we left our old, old building, we didn't realize that the worst financial crisis was about to hit the United States. If somebody had told me that, we would have never left. And here's the point. During the worst time in history, financially, God blessed us the most. So if you think that this message is to help you, help us pay for this building, you're greatly mistaken because God will take care of us. If he's been through the roughest time in life, this is nothing. The message this morning is, is much more than about giving. It's about what do you believe God has done for you? It's going to be a tough message. Don't, don't misunderstand. It's going to be a tough message. But it's not about uh, how much you give. It's about how much you believe God has done for you. How much you believe what you have belongs to God. And if you still judge my motives, here's my challenge to you. Some of the pastor gave this challenge and I stole it from him. Here's my challenge to you. I still want you to tithe. I still want you to give grace give. I don't believe in tithing. I believe in grace giving. I still want you to do that, but give it to another church. If you doubt my motives, if you feel like this is to get money out of your pockets, please do it to another church. Because I don't want you to miss out on a fundamental step of obedience that you are not fulfilling. Are you saved? Because giving is a gospel problem. If you're not giving, it's because somewhere there is a misunderstanding of what you believe about the gospel. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Holy Spirit, we pray today. Help us to understand the true meaning of this message. Help us to understand that Jesus paid it all, and all to him we owe. Oh God, let my words be full of wisdom, but also full of grace and compassion. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say, Amen. You may be seated.
As I mentioned last weekend, many of you were here, but those who haven't, please check out the website, YouTube, and everything. The messages are there. The book of Malachi reads like a courtroom trial where the people of Israel are on trial, and it's God's court. God is the prosecuting attorney. God is the witness. God is also the judge, and God is also the executioner. This is God's court. And his people are on trial for being bitter and hateful against him. They're on trial for giving God what doesn't hurt. But I don't want you to misunderstand because it seems like it's all negative, as if God is saying, I'm going to nail you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to just, you know, prosecute you to the extent of the law. No, it's much more than that because this message, God is also their public defender. God is also their public defender who is trying to negotiate a plea bargain that will help them. Did you get that? This is God's courtroom, but it's not God's desire to just put you in prison. It's God's desire to listen. You are guilty, but if you let me help you, I can really work this one out so you'll walk away better than you walked in. Listen to what God says again. We just read this passage, verse 6. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. God begins by giving the foundational covenant statement. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I do not change. In other words, God was holding up the old contract that he had made with his people. But with whom did he make that contract? O sons of Jacob. This contract was made with their great, 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 great granddaddy Jacob. Now why didn't God say, O sons of Abraham? Because Abraham was also the father of the Ishmaelites. Remember? Ishmael first and then Isaac. But Ishmael did not have a covenant with God. His people were consumed. God did not say, O sons of Isaac, because Isaac was also the father of the Edomites. Remember Esau and then Jacob? And the Edomites were also consumed. What God is saying to them is this. Listen up, listen. He is saying, unlike the Ishmaelites and the Edomites who have vanished, you are still alive because of me. Because I made an agreement with your great, 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 great granddaddy that I will not abandon you. These people were ungrateful. These people were bitter. They were robbing God. And God was telling them, listen, everything that you are is because of me. I am the reason for your existence. Let me ask you this morning. Same question I asked a few minutes ago. What do you believe about God? You see, the message is not about how much you give. The message is about how much you believe belongs to God. Folks, everything that you and I have belongs to God. Everything. Uh, You know, you could have been born on some other side of the planet in a slum. You are born here, living in this world, in this society, with all its problems, still is the best world, the best country. This is God's blessing. How much can you take credit for that? Did you navigate your way to this world? No. Somehow, God in his providence has blessed you. I'm standing here preaching to you. Any moment my heart can stop breathing, my brain waves can stop functioning, and I can die. Who is keeping my heart and my brain alive? It's God. And not only that, but also because we sin, our grandparents sin, and the sin nature is in us, God says, I will even take care of that. You can't die for your sins because you die, it's over. I will send my son into this world and he will take your sin upon him and he will die for you. All you have to do is look to him and live. Now, folks, I don't know which part we can take credit for. You say, well, look, I got to get up in the morning and go to work. Now, I mean, you know, God helps those who help themselves. I've heard people say that. That's baloney. Please don't say that. Please don't say that. Even there, God helps you. Everything is God. Everything is Him. You see, giving is really a gospel problem. If you have trouble with the gospel that Jesus has done 
everything for you, then everything that you are is his. He has redeemed you. He has bought you with his precious blood. You don't belong to him. You are a slave of Christ. I, I hope this, this really stays with you. I hope it's resonating as I'm preaching the rest of the message. Everything that you are belongs to God. Everything that you are belongs to God. Now let's go further. Verse 7, God says, I will make a plea bargain with you. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances, have not kept them. And here's the deal. Come back to me. Here's the plea bargain. Come back to me and I will come back to you, says the Lord of hosts. Very simple. Repent. By the way, that is the foundational message of all the prophets in the Old Testament. Repent. You know what repentance is? Admitting that you messed up. Human beings say, I, I, I didn't mess up. I didn't mess up. No, you messed up. You have sinned. Get on your face. Ask God for forgiveness. Repent. But then God says something here. The people are saying, in what way shall we return? What do you mean we got to return? God says, okay. Let's get a little more specific. Will a person rob God? Man, it's not just masculine. It's about a person. Will a person rob God? Yet you have robbed me. How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now many of you know what a tithe is. A tithe is 10% of everything that you have. Everything that you make. Is the old English word tithe, which really meant tenth. If you think about the word tithe, tenth, it's the same. That's what it comes from. It's old English. Actually, it comes from the Old Testament, the concept. There were three kinds of tithes in the Old Testament. First was a general tithe of the land. In fact, in Leviticus 27, verse 30, it says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, it is holy to the Lord. Means right off the top, 10% of everything is holy unto God. It belongs to God. It is sanctified unto God. So what do you do with it? God says, I'll tell you what you need to do with it. Numbers 18, 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting means this is what I want you to do. I want you to take that general tithe and bring it to the tabernacle. When they moved into the city, bring it to the temple. This is where the general tithe needs to go. Why? Because that's how the worship takes place. This is where the sacrifices are happening. I want you to bring it in. The second tithe, kind of confusing, but it's eating a portion of the tithe at the sacred meal when the first tithe was given. I know that's confusing. But listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 14.22. You shall surely tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, which is Jerusalem. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Isn't God, isn't God amazing that he says, listen, I want you to tithe. But when you come to bring your tithe, I want you to sit down and eat portion of that. In a sense, that's also tithing to me. It's like, this belongs to me, but I want you to share in it as well. Come on. God is so amazing. So beautiful. The third kind of tithe was a tithe that was given every three years for the poor. Deuteronomy 14, 28, it says, And the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. Who is it for? It's for the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you. The Levites were not supposed to own land. God says this will go to help their families. Who else? And the stranger and the fatherless and the widow. Who are within your gates may come in and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Isn't it amazing that God said, I care about the poor. I care about those who are hurting. Now, folks, I'll be the first one to tell you, 
that our American financial system is broken. We agree with that? I mean, people get checks for what they don't need. Uh, we're helping people who don't need help, and those who need help don't get help. Everybody amen on that? I mean, the system is broken. We all agree on that. But if the church did its job, we didn't need the system. It's because the church failed to take care of those in need, the government stepped in, and boy, it's wonderful, isn't it? But God was always telling his people, you are the one to take care of those who don't have anything. Now, what were these people doing? Why were they robbing God? Why were they keeping their tithes and their offerings from God? Now, keep in mind the context. The context is this. These people had just come back from exile. They had just come back into Babylon, the, uh, living in Judah. It's been 100 years since they left Judah. It was 100 years since they moved out of Jerusalem, living in Babylon. And what were they doing? I mean, some of them were working in the king's court. Some of them were working... Uh, in making jewelry, writing music, all this kind of stuff. When they came back to Israel, when they came back to Judah, the only thing they could do was farm. Now imagine if somebody told you, from this day on, Jonathan, you're a farmer. I want you to go till the grass, till the ground, whatever you need to do. And you'd be like, no, I don't know what I'm doing. Or from this point on, you are a sheep herder. No, or from this point on, I want you to go and handle this herd of 100 sheep. I don't know what to do with them. Well, just take them around, and then, then you shear them, and then you sell all the stuff, and you're going, I don't know what I'm up to. I don't know what's happening. Plus, life was tough for them. Not only were they inadequate, but the drought came, the locust came, and the enemies around them hated them because they came back into their old homes, just like today. And so all this thing was against them. Some of these people were, were also very rich. They were working for the Persian government, so they were trying to fleece the people. If you read the book of Nehemiah, it'll tell you. They were taking advantage of their own brothers and sisters. They were charging usury. You know what usury is? Excessively high interest rate. Oh, yeah, we'll rent you, lend you money, but pretty much you are now a dead slave. There was also bribery. Oh, you want to get ahead? You want to sell your goats and your sheep first? But, uh, got to gre grease my palm right here. Then there was also fraud. People were taking advantage of the poor, taking money from them and not delivering. There was corruption. All these things were happening, and the people were feeling, why do I have to give when I don't even have much? Let the rich give. Uh, let the ones who are working for Persia give. I ain't got no money. But isn't that amazing that God doesn't say, oh, that's right, I understand how tough life is for you. You know what? It's okay. God says, no, you're robbing me. You're robbing me. Many of you have already made up your mind why you can't give because, oh, well, the kids need this. And my rent is due, and my this is this, and my health is bad, and I'm on a fixed income. You've already made up your mind why you're not going to tithe. Listen, the same word that God said to his people, he's saying to you, you are thieves. Will a man rob God? The answer is, of course, they were robbing God. Now, when I preach a message like this, immediately some people will say, whoa, look, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tithing is Old Testament Mosaic law. We're not under the law. Christ is the end of the law. So tithing doesn't apply to us. It's all I agree. But guess what? We believe in grace giving. It means there's a whole lot more now. Tithing is just the benchmark, just the starting point. Now everything. What did the disciples, the apostles do? They sold everything they had brought to the Lord. Now, we're not supposed to go do that. We're not into communal living. But get the message. They realized that everything they had belonged to God. The Bible says they first gave themselves to the Lord and then everything else. By the way, very quickly, if you believe that it only started with Moses, who came first, Moses or Abraham? Who came first? Abraham did. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. 
Who came first, Jacob or Moses? Jacob tithed. Folks, those were not isolated incidents. They were something that was already accepted. I believe this was something God had told his people since the beginning of time. The point here is all of us are called to give above and beyond the tithes. Are you giving? Are you giving? This morning, let's do a little math. This is where it gets a little hot in this place. People say, well, look, I'm, I'm, I, I put in $20. I put $20 in the offering plate. Man, I, I give a lot. Really? Here's my question to you. If that is your tithe, let's just use tithe. If that is your tithe, I'm assuming you're making $200 a month. You know, really, truly, we need to take up an offering for you today. Honestly, you need help. You really need help. We, we'll help you out, brother, sister, whoever you are. Is that all you're making a month? He said, oh, no, no, no. What we do is we give $50, and that's a lot of money. I could go out to eat at a very fancy restaurant for $50, and I'm giving that to church. I'm assuming that that means that you're making $500 a month. We really should help you as well. Is that what you're making? He said, oh, no, no. I give a hundred dollars. That's, that's big stuff now. hundred dollars. You know what I could do with a hundred dollars right now, preacher? I, I mean, that's a lot of money. I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're surviving on a thousand dollars a month. I don't know how you make it. Will a man rob God? Will a woman rob God? Absolutely. Absolutely. You're robbing God. Now listen to what God says in verse 9. This is tough. He said, you're cursed with a curse. Since you're robbing me, here's the problem. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. This entire nation is robbing me. Another book, it tells us, God says, there's a hole in your pocket. Every time you put money in there, it doesn't stay. By the way, if that money doesn't belong to you, one way or the other, it's going to leave you. It's going to go to the hospital. It's going to go to the mechanic. It's going to go somewhere. It's not going to stay with you. Just know that. You say, well, does that mean that if I give to God, all these bad things won't happen to me? No, what I'm saying to you is this. Somehow there is blessing when you are faithfully giving to God, there is blessing that somehow God makes things work in your life when you are faithful to him. Amen. Something else God says to them. Verse 10, he said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And then he says, and try me now in this. Means here's a challenge to you. Try me. Try me. What do you try, God. He said, if you do this, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Many of you have never taken up God's challenge. Oh, you, you, you do everything. You do this, that, and the other. When it comes to giving, you say, oh, I, can't, I can't do that. My kids are in school. My this and that. My this is happening. All this stuff. And, and what you're doing ultimately is saying, I cannot trust God with my money. Here, here's the funny thing. You got, trust God with eternity? Are you sure? You sure you want to trust God with what you haven't seen? I don't know. Something else God says in verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And verse 12, all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land. Folks, this is not a problem-free land. It's a delightful land. It means there will be joy in your home. There will be peace in your household. I would be lying to you if I tell you that we don't have needs that we have to put aside and say, no, not right now. We can't afford that. I would be lying to you if I tell you that we haven't had hospital bills that we go, I don't know how exactly we're going to pay all this. 
But there is delightfulness in our home. There is joy in our marriage. There is joy in the life of our children. Somehow, God is working all things together for good. It is not a problem-free life. It's a delightful life. You know, when I first came to America, I didn't have anything. My dad gave me $500, and you all know what I did with that money. I bought some pumps, the shoes. I thought I, I could jump like those people do, and I brought, bought a nice Casio watch that you could go down 1,000 feet underwater, and you could tell time. If I ever got in that situation, I wouldn't know what time it is. And I wasted all my money. It was gone in the first month. And I started working what is known as the work-study program where you work 30 hours a week and everything you have goes on your school bill. But if you want it, they will give you 10%. And so I would work and make $600. They would give me $60. That's all I had to live on for the whole month. I mean, think about it. Shampoo. Shampoo actually stole from my roommate. He just didn't know. Uh, uh, other things, you know, right, other stuff that, 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 that you know, but here's the funny thing. I would go to chapel because I couldn't drive, no car. I would go to chapel on campus. And when the offering plate came by, it was like, this is all I have. But my parents growing up, many, many times they would hold up the tithe check, their offering check. Remember, they believed in grace giving. And they would say, listen, no matter what happens, you Always be faithful to God. And when that happened, I would give. I would give. It was a funny thing. They would send me a receipt from the business office. I would go see them, and they would say, well, I guess it's coming back to us, isn't it? Because the chapel belonged to the school. And they would, it would amaze them. It would amaze me. But guess what, folks? 20 years later, God has abundantly blessed me abundantly beyond comparison and I don't deserve it R.G. Letourneau one of my heroes in the faith when he was going through depression you know the, the great depression you know the big heavy machinery guy he was going through depression he made a pact with God he said from this day on it's no longer how much of my money I'm going to give to God it's about how much of God's money do I get to keep His legacy still continues. This morning, are you giving? Start giving like you are supposed to, and there will be a change in how you see this place. You know, here's a statement I want to make to you very quickly. <clears throat> Whatever you buy stock in, you care about. If you buy stock in this place, when you give in this church, you begin to care about this church. If you notice, I listen to a lot of people, but there's only some people I really follow up on. You say, what do you mean by that? When you complain, when you want this, that, and the other, my next question in my mind is, how much do you really give? You say, oh, you know? Of course I do. I love you anyways. You say, oh, I thought pastors were not supposed to. A shepherd doesn't know his sheep. So next thing you know, I'm going to appoint you to be our financial director, and you don't give a dime to the church. Don't you think I need to know? Of course I need to know. Many years ago in our deacons meeting, I said, oh, this person right here is going to be amazing. Man, they got so much smarts. They're going to help. And one of our older deacons has pulled me aside and said, hey, preacher, just to let you know, they don't give anything to the church. I said, oh, boy, that changes the whole train of thought. I, I, listen, where, where are you in giving? Where are you in giving? It changes the way you think about this place. It changes the way you treat this place. Let me close with this. I don't know why it is, but God has chosen to use money as the acid test of our faith because we worship it. He didn't say God and the devil. 
He said, you cannot worship God and mammon. You cannot worship God and money. He put money at the same level because we worship it. You say, oh, you don't know what our problems are. Hey, listen, in our home, the first thing that goes out is tithe. You say, oh, you just started that because the church is growing and you get more money. No, that's always been the case. The first thing that directly goes out is what we give to God. Somehow the bills get paid. I don't know how. Where are you? You say, ah, you know, I know you're trying to build that building, and I, I, know, I know you need some money, and I know it's going to be a lot of loans and this and that. My challenge to you still stands. I still want you to give, but give to another church. There, we solved that problem. If you are concerned that we're going to hurt, trust me, God's going to take care of us. Give to another church. But start tithing, start grace giving today. See what God is willing to give you. Would you stand together?